Coming up next on CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. Welcome in to a special Tuesday edition of the Ion College Basketball Podcast. I am not Bill Raftery. I am Matt Norlander, and I am joined by Ian Eagle, who, of course, is taking over the lead voice of play-by-play duties uh, for CBS and Turner and the Men's NCAA Tournament Final Four. It's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, Ian. And uh, yeah, we can just get rolling here. But I just, I, I got to say, I'm so thankful that after I got to your third layer of publicist, I could finally make contact. With you. <laughs> That's right. I have a lot of people, a lot of people. Rick, are you comfortable <laughs> with this look? Uh, yes? Okay. Yeah, no, we're we're good to go. Matt, let, let me say this. This okay. is obviously a pretty important three-week period and in my life, in my career. And with all that said, I get placed in Brooklyn for the opening weekend. And you would think my focus would be on the games. You have four games that first day. You've got a lot of information. And the only thing I was concerned with was that you were sitting behind me and that you were cognizant of the fact that we might go to an on-camera and I don't want you to get caught in between a scratch or a pick. Like the last thing you need at that point is to go anywhere near your nose. And then it fuels the internet at that point. It takes over the internet. Was it a pick? Was it a scratch? So yeah. very no clean. Pick, no pick. No, no. no pick. Actually, the, uh, the very first time we came on camera, uh, I say we, cause obviously I was, I was part of the play by play team. Of course. <laughs> um, I, w- I happened to be on the phone with a source uh, at an ill-time call, but it was one where like I, n- I did need to take the call. Yeah. And so when that was happening, uh, then the text messages started to roll and get off the phone, Norlander. Yeah. I will Good. as I possibly Good. can. So. You're on television. What yes. are you doing right exactly. now? Is that a real phone call? I'm sure Good that was here. actually the... Yeah, hold on. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was it was a real phone call. And uh, and no, man, you are the best. I appreciate the kind words you had to say in Brooklyn. And we'll get to this. Uh, we'll get to this tournament. Obviously, I want to get talk so much about uh, I and having this new role. But I do want to at least for the audience that is very familiar with you, but might not be familiar with how you got your start. Just a quickie mm. biographical thing here. What's the first, I'm curious, the first time you ever had your voice go over the air for any kind of game, any format, figure was probably radio. How old were you? Was it when you were at Syracuse before that? Uh, Do you remember the game? Yeah, I traveled as a young boy with the circus and uh, that was, whoa, what a (laughs) entry into the entertainment field. No, I, I always knew I wanted to be a broadcaster. I was eight years old when when I actually verbalized it and, and said it to my parents. And they were very, very positive in their response. So at that stage of life, when your parents tell you you can do something, you actually believe it. You you think it's it's possible. So a lot of broadcasts on my bed with baseball cards and then in the shower, there, there was a lot going on in there. Very good acoustics. And then, you know, you play pickup basketball with your friends and you start calling the game. And that is very annoying, I realized, to the other participants. So Russ Gans and Stephen Justman and Jeff Hill and Matt Yoles, buddies that were like, dude, enough. Okay, we understand. You drove the lane. You don't need to say it out loud. I didn't really do anything about it until I got to Syracuse. And went there because of the great reputation and dove right in. I was doing stuff on one of the student stations freshman year, moved over into the late sophomore year territory at the other student station. And that meant women's basketball play-by-play, men's basketball play-by-play, football play-by-play, lacrosse play-by-play, some high school play-by-play for local cable, and then anything I could get involved in. Like truly, I I viewed it as I will say yes to anything. So yeah, early stages of Syracuse, making tapes up at the Carrier Dome. You're talking about a time in the Big East that was seminal. Syracuse-Georgetown was the go-to matchup in my mind. And I got to feel like I was part of it for four years as not just a fan, but then transitioning over to the broadcast side. 
Dig it. Um, out of curiosity, I'm very familiar with the Syracuse campus. I know a bunch of folks who uh, who went there. Uh, did you have the fortune as maybe a freshman or sophomore to live in Lawrenson and just have the quick walk over to the Carrier Dome, or where well, where was your, uh, oh, your spot? You're flexing your knowledge. No, no, I I lived in uh, Flint Hall. Okay. Year moved into the fraternity sophomore year there, sophomore junior year, and then senior year uh, at an apartment complex called Castle Court. Which, and, that's, and that's where the Iron Eagle mural still stands today, correct? And it sounds much more impressive than than it actually is. Uh, there were holes in walls. There might have been asbestos. Uh, not not to start a lawsuit. This was many many years ago. I'm sure they took care of the issue. But yeah, that was that was my four year journey geographically at Syracuse. What was your first gig out of college? The first uh, paid gig, was it full-time, part-time? Uh, do you remember? Yeah, full-time. Uh, I got a job at WFAN Radio in New York as a producer, worked seven to midnight. That was my shift. Four to midnight was uh, the actual hours in Astoria, New York, Queens. I was living literally on Queens Boulevard. Uh, that was that was my my life. I loved every second of it. I uh, was living out an episode of Entourage. I was Queens Boulevard, truly. And I got so much knowledge from being around that atmosphere, the osmosis. It was like graduate school, truly, Matt, in being around the people that were there. It was Mike and the Mad Dog at the time. And I ended up working with them behind the scenes for a year of my career. And that was invaluable. But Howie Rose and Ed Coleman and Dave Sims and Steve Summers, Steve Summers, mm. all of these people yes. played such a large role in in my development and my love for broadcasting because it it was like a sitcom in many ways and the experiences that I had there helped me every step along the way. Everywhere I went, I I just had a mentality of how it was supposed to be and did my part to try to make it feel that way, feel social and familial in some way. And that continues even today. And by the way, I'll link this as well in the episode description. Uh, Brian Curtis of The Ringer wrote an outstanding feature on, on Ian and his upbringing and his parents that I cannot recommend enough. Uh, Brian's yeah. an incredible, incredible media yeah. writer, and he did a, he did an unbelievable job. Uh, I presume the check is in the mail, Ian, when it comes to that. Um, <laughs> I am curious, uh, and someone in the chat's already asked a question that I had loaded up, so I'll, I'll ask that at the end. But what are, and I know you must have gotten this question before, but uh, with you specifically, I, I'm curious on your perspective on it. Sure. What are the traits in your experience? Like every announcer has got to have some things about the job that need to stay consistent in order to be a yeah. high-level broadcaster, but there's going to be things that separate you from everyone else. But what are the traits most announcers have, the thing about them that leads them down the path of wanting to do this? Most And that most people are going to come to that conclusion. You came to it as an 8-year-old. Uh, yeah. Most are going to find that path uh, as a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, 14-year-old, 16-year-old, like before they are, you know, mostly through college. Uh, in your opinion, what are the one, two, or three things that seem to have the most commonalities among the people in your field? I think the ones that truly excel are interesting people, but then have the other trait where you are interested in other people. So it's one thing that you might have an interesting background or a path that that is unique, but you can't ever lose that sense of curiosity. It, you want to have that that quest for more knowledge. You want to learn more. And I probably at times have finally figured out how to back away from the laptop or the newspaper or the media guide. But certainly as I was coming through the ranks, I just wanted to immerse myself completely in whatever subject matter I was covering. And that meant going five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 layers deep to try to come up with a nugget or a factoid that might be interesting to the viewing audience. So I think being a really good teammate in television helps a great deal. There's a collaborative process and you're not the most important part of it. Everybody plays a role in making a broadcast really successful. And then the last part, at least from a broadcaster point of view, play-by-play -play announcer specifically, I would almost compare it to a going to dinner or a dinner party. Are you a good guest? Can you tell a story, but can you listen to a story, be a good audience when someone else is telling that story and still gain joy from that 
uh, the back and forth, the banter. Uh, I'd like to think uh, that's where I, I found a niche in this business of connecting with my analysts and and finding a place where we can both do well, not just me or not just them, that we're doing well together as a team. Uh, no question on that. And I'll get to uh, you working with Bill Raftery and, of course, Grant Hill uh, in this tournament and revving up for the Final Four. But uh, there's something I've uh, noticed about your your style. And um, I'm frankly thrilled to, to ask you this uh, question because I would think that it resonates with, with audience as well. You have... You have an infectious energy about the way you call a game and your delivery. Like it infuses a joy, but also a certain kind of jolt into every broadcast. The way that you can make your voice pop after yeah. like a big shot, dunk, block, or if it's a different sport, you know, uh, a big sack, yeah. whatever. It's like a drummer that knows the exact moment and the emphasis on how to hit a symbol. Yeah. I wonder if this has come naturally to you or did you work on it early in your career? Because I've been listening to you call games for two plus decades and I cannot remember you not having this forte in how you call a game. Uh, it feels like it's, it's a gift from God, but I'm, I'm curious on, on that stuff. Like, uh, you know, a man's jam, et cetera, et cetera. But even like... Yeah. The banger after banger with DJ Burns all of all of two days ago. Um, maybe maybe it is just second nature, but I wonder if you actually had to, to work on that craft early in your career. Uh, probably the the greatest compliment that you could have just given me. So thank you, Matt. I, I think all broadcasters want to feel that they're at one with the event that they're calling, and they're not hovering over it. They're in it, and I can't say that I felt that immediately because you have to work through it. There, there is a period where you're trying to find your voice, you're trying to find the rhythm, uh, you're trying to discover the phraseology that works in the moment. This is unscripted. Uh, there is no safety net. This is a high wire act every time you go on the air. Uh, and you're judged only on your last broadcast. You're not judged on what you did 15 years ago. You're not judged on what you did two weeks earlier. You're judged on the broadcast that you're doing that day. So with that comes a feeling of performance that you do have to go out and emote and perform in that two hour and, and 10 minute block during a college basketball game. And the other part, which you just hit on, is a certain rhythm and a beat to working the crowd, uh, making sure that your analyst is getting enough touches and then taking over and having command in the moment when it requires. And that comes from years and years of doing it and then years and years of listening to others that were really good at it, that had an impact, that you would hear their timing, their cadence, their inflection. And not to say you mimic it, but you figure out what works for you. And what I did learn through the years is the, the circumstances surrounding the event that you're calling. The crowd. This is going to be different. I'm going to be the first to tell you calling the Final Four in a stadium setting is different than calling it in an arena setup. The venue is different. The sound is different. The fact that the, the fans are farther away from you and they're deeper. It goes deeper and up. It slopes up. That will be an adjustment period for me. I've done games in stadiums, so it's not as if I'm walking in completely blind. But it is an adjustment and it is a little bit different. So just not treating everything the same and and thinking that, uh, oh, I've done this before, so I'll just lean on what I've done before. You, you got to have a game plan. And then the last part of the equation, uh, I would say, is you have to be a, a student of this. You, know, you have to actually listen back to your stuff and you have to be self-critical and and try to do the things necessary to improve and polish and get better and correct because trust me i haven't nailed every call in my life but i'd like to think that i'm now at a higher percentage than i was earlier in my career uh per the t terms of uh of ian's contract we actually need at least one live break on this show so wow. uh, yeah listen I, I i we might as well just get it out of the way nice and early here not a quick a, a word from our partners here and then we'll get to the back half of our conversation with ian eagle Ready. The blackout mystery. Welcome to March Madness. Oh, oh. You just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. Oh, yeah. 
actually, if you're watching live on YouTube, I was actually expecting a full on Iron Eagle infomercial there. Uh, I'll, I'll have, <laughs> I'm going to have a conversation with our folks after the fact here. Just please take it easy on me, Iron, after, please. Just no problem. You're good. Take gloves, I beg of you. Um, you are obviously teaming up here with uh, with Bill Raftery and Grant Hill. And let's let's talk on Raft. Another tremendous writer, Kevin Armstrong for NJ Advance Media, wrote a profile specifically. Fantastic. On, uh, just just ama amazing stuff. It, and Kevin is a fantastic, another fantastic writer. And it was titled "When Bird Met Bill." Um, <laughs> before we get to you guys uh, working here on this final four, uh, let let's hear the story. When did you first encounter? When did Bill Raftery? And to your professional life, because no question you were uh, all too familiar with him before you ever worked together. But uh, when, where, why, and how? Give us uh, give us the origin story of Bird and Bill. The amazing part about it, Matt, is I met him for the first time at the Big East Tournament 1990. I had been in the same arena as him or in the case of the Carrier Dome, the same stadium as him, but had never actually gone up to him, introduced myself until the Big East Tournament. 1990, my senior year, I had to do a pregame interview. And I thought to myself, who better than Bill Raftery? So I approach him. I said, hey, Coach Raftery, always good to call him coach because now you're, you're bringing him in. I said, I'm Ian Eagle from WAAR Radio in Syracuse. And he said, what? He had no idea what I, what I just said. I don't even think he was familiar with the Lewis Gossett film. May he rest in peace. He just passed away. Mm -hmm. He just had no idea what I said. So I went past the name. I said, hoping to do an interview with you for the pregame. He said, well, when? I said, how about right now? He said, okay. And he did it. We did a four-minute interview at MSG prior to uh, the Big East tournament that year. The next time that I see him is 1990. Four, I get hired as the Nets radio announcer. I'm on the road with the Nets and Bill as the TV analyst. And Matt, he's so welcoming. It's as if I had known him forever. He's busting chops from the moment that I met him. But I think you realize in the dynamic with him, that means that you're good. That means that you can be in his orbit. You can be in his world. So you're talking about countless, countless dinners and countless adult beverages, getting to know one another for a full year before I'm named the TV play-by-play -play man the next year. And now that begins a legitimate television partnership. So probably the best thing to ever happen to me truly in my career was that I got paired with Bill and I learned how to be your true self, how to be genuine in how you approach the game and let your love and your passion and your joy come through when you broadcast. Because when you're at that stage of your career trying to figure things out, you are at that point very much trying to sort through what your style is going to be, what your approach and philosophy. I was a ball of clay I was just going off instincts. Bill, without telling me, without saying, hey, kid, do it this way, just following him was, was the path that led me to figuring out how to do this and, and at least try to do it well. You, uh, per Armstrong's article, you two have worked more than 500 games together. Um, when you received the, the call or however you received the news that you would actually succeed, a good friend Jim Nance, uh, and being the voice of the Final Four, uh, I'm wondering how long it took. Maybe it was a millisecond um, to 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 for your brain to compute. Oh, I'm I'm going to get this opportunity, but I'm going to get it. And Raftery, Bill's going to be there. Yep. Like how how much for you? It would have been an amazing assignment, regardless. But the fact that you get to do this and have this, you know, get this bump up, be be the guy, the play by play guy. But you are getting to do it with your longtime friend and someone that's been there beside you, you know, for decades, I have to imagine that that means as much to you and is, is, is much of a boost in the situation in year one for you as anything I am. Completely. And the familiarity with Bill, with Grant, with Tracy, that was part of the reason why I thought the transition was not going to be that challenging. It feels easy. It feels normal. It feels like it's supposed to be this way. The bill part of the component is, uh, it's huge in that we have so much shared experience already and trust 
and respect. And I speak raftery, the shorthand of raftery, I understand. So for many years on Nets broadcast, I always thought I was the perfect interpreter for Bill, his sayings that I could make them feel like regular nomenclature, even though if you didn't know what Bill was talking about, you still kind of liked it because he said it in a in a festive way. But I could translate for him. And it still happens to th this day, not just on the air, but but off the air as well with waiters, uh, with front desk. Uh, workers with uh, airport gate agents. I can't tell you how many times it happens in our day-to-day -day life where I can step in and and make the connection. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing in the grand scheme. We were doing Nets games in near anonymity. Yeah. The Nets were not a huge draw. They were in New Jersey. They were not winning a whole lot of games. The TV broadcasts were not killing the ratings by any stretch, but he and I had a had a special kinship and we were trying to make one another laugh and entertain one another. And somehow that turned into entertaining, hopefully millions of people that are watching the game and feel like they're part of it. You know, that's one thing that I, I have tried to articulate. I think a successful broadcast isn't a fan eavesdropping on a good conversation. I think they want to feel like they are involved in the conversation and hopefully that's something that that people are experiencing at home or on their phones or wherever they're taking in the action i think you have uh i don't know if you've outright retired but uh my understanding is you have given up the uh the race with raf and the uh oh, yeah. the post-game situation so uh, <laughs> let's make an official statement here is it an outright retirement and even if it's not when did I don't know if this is something in recent years or if you've been out of the game since the mid aughts. When, uh, when did you officially say, hi, no, I, I am done, sir. No, I got out in the nineties. Uh, I'm going to take it a step further. I was still a very young man and realized that this was going to be detrimental to my health. I, I couldn't keep up. I attempted to keep up the first few years. I felt like crap consistently so I would wake up not feeling great. We'd have a game in Indiana or Milwaukee or wherever we were. And then, and this is certainly uh, not, not me trying to brag. I'd go to the gym at the hotel and Raph would be there on the treadmill doing his dopey walk as if nothing, I hate Barrett, like nothing happened. I was like, you're not human, man. And by like 98, 99, I just realized it didn't mean I didn't go out with him. I did. I just had a, a time in mind that would be the cutoff. And I knew he would rip me in the moment, but I also knew by the morning all was forgiven. So I think victory for me, because I figured it out. I stood up to Raph in those moments. Most do not. Fair enough. I like to hear that. I'm going to quote Curtis's piece. Talk about Grant Hill real quick because he has yep. he has a heck of an anecdote, and uh, this is this is incredible. And Grant is amazing. It uh, yes. quoted directly here. From time to time, Eagle was reminded in the funniest possible way that he was not yet a headliner. In 2015, CBS assigned <laughs> newbie announcer Grant Hill to call a Notre Dame Duke game. When a producer told Hill the name of his play-by-play -play announcer, he misheard it as Iron Eagle, That's right. uh, and so he thought he must be working with Nance little next graph that weekend in Durham, North Carolina, Hill remained unaware that Eagle was his partner. Even as they watched practice together, I keep thinking, who is this production assistant who won't shut up? Hill told me <laughs> that night Hill finally realized nice. iron was calling the, that is an incredible detail. Um, <laughs> just, I mean, speak on how amazing Grant is and, and anything you might have uh, recalled about that, that interaction. Um, yes. because I'm all too familiar with it, obviously, with having approached you a number of times and uh, you finally recognizing uh, who, you know, my who I am only recently in the past. couple. <laughs> yeah. So two things. One, that specific interaction. Keep in mind, Grant parachutes in. He has never done a college basketball game. He's certainly never done a game for CBS. He had just come off hosting inside stuff. Right. And they were trying to figure out, all right, what's going to be the, the next move for Grant Hill in the broadcast landscape? So he gets paired with me and Raph. It's his first game, and it's at Duke. So he's got a lot going on. He's going back to campus. He shows up at practice. We've already established ourselves courtside. So Grant gets in a little bit later, 
And he had already, I think, met with Coach K and then done something on the campus. He joins us for the, the last 10 minutes or so. And, you know, I just give a quick handshake over, but it's practice. So we're not talking deep. Then we have a little bit of a production meeting. And now I'm talking a lot during the production meeting of, hey, I think we should follow this. We should do that. And now we head back to the hotel. We say, all right, let's meet downstairs at seven o'clock for dinner. And we come downstairs and I'm there and Grant's already in the lobby and he comes up to me. He's like, Ian, I just want to apologize. I said, for what? He said, I thought Jim Nance was doing the game and he was staying under a pseudonym of Iron Eagle. I said, oh, <laughs> I, said, I didn't put two to two together. I said, dude, you're good. We're good. And then we have a wonderful dinner. We actually had a great broadcast, his introduction. So that's amazing. Uh, Tremendous. I mean, really, really funny. It was like an episode of Three's Company, really. So the second part, yeah, I get hired by the Nets in 1994. And before we do our first regular season game, they said, hey, I and you and Mike O'Corn, my broadcast partner, former star at North Carolina and played for the Nets as well. And uh, the then Washington Bullets, you're going to do a practice game. We're going to send you to Detroit for the preseason opener. And you'll call it, but not on the air, just into a, uh, a tape machine. I said, great. And guess what? It's Grant Hill's NBA debut, his rookie year. <laughs> Off the opening tip, first game, the ball gets tapped over to Grant Hill. He dunks three seconds in to his NBA debut, which is a preseason game, which happened to be my NBA broadcast debut. So I call that. That's the first call I ever made as an NBA announcer. That was the first play he ever made. And here we are all these years later working together. He is a great guy, as classy as an individual, tremendous sense of humor, uh, sees the game, loves the game, is an ambassador for the game. Uh, it's been a really special, special pairing. That's just, that is, uh, you know, sometimes the universe has a way of just winking at us. That is incredible. Oh, yeah. That's an awesome, awesome, awesome story. Um, uh, we got a question in the chat. I'll pop it with you right now here. Sure. Um, we're actually running long. Are, are you good for a few more minutes here, by yes. the way? Okay. Yes. Um, uh, Matthew in the chat asks, is Ian's approach to college versus NBA ball any different? Do differences in player coach availability change the way he prepares? Okay. Or does it contribute to him finding one more compelling than the other? In short... Uh, what are the differences for you, if any, in calling a college basketball game versus an NBA game? Yeah, Matthew, great question. Uh, I would say just if you went through calling the game NBA compared to college NBA, there are a lot of highlights. Highlight, 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 highlight. So you really have to pick and choose your spots. But the thing about NBA that I learned very early in my career, there's a chance that you could have the best highlight of the season nine seconds into a game. And if you're not ready for it, you're going to look back and say, man, how did I blow that? Nobody, when they roll the highlight five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, says, I wonder what was going on that day. Uh, I wonder what the play-by-play -play person was thinking. All they do is roll the highlight back. So I just recognized early, you have to be ready to go to 10 at any moment. College is a little different in that sense. The flow of the game is different, and you have to rise to the occasion when the moment truly calls for it. So when DJ Burns is on a heater, you got to bring it. In my opinion, you got to meet the moment. Those moments come, you got to meet them. The other part, as a play by play announcer, college to pro, the crowd, NBA crowd, yes. Big playoff game, late in the game, in Sacramento, in San Francisco. Of course, uh, you're going to feel the energy. The difference in a college game, you feel it from the opening tip. You feel it at courtside. And even in Brooklyn, uh, where you were for the first two rounds of the tournament, there was an electricity. Mm -hmm. You felt it permeating. And you got to be ready for it as an announcer. If not, you're going to get swallowed up by it. So I think my approach has changed through the years where I've realized that I've got to be on it early 
for college where the energy level is so high inside the arena. If you soft shoe it in any way, because, well, it's only 22 to 20, no, you got to match it. In terms of accessibility, if you're doing a national game on TNT, you do get access to the head coaches. Uh, if you're doing a local game, not as much. You're attending press conferences. If you're doing a national game for CBS, yes, you, you do have more access and maybe you get a few more personal tidbits compared to some of the other assignments that I would have. Uh, I want to obviously preview the final four quickly, but I do want to yeah. ask if you remember best tournament game you've ever called, uh, where, when, what, what pops to mind over your decades long career calling uh, the men's NCAA tournament? I, I would say two games come to mind just based on the circumstances of the game and then uh, the level of play. Jim Spinarkle and I did a second round game in 2005 in Cleveland, West Virginia, Wake Forest, double overtime game, Chris Paul's last game as a college player, Mike Yanzi, Kevin Pitznagle, that group, John Beeline. It was just a stupendous basketball game. So much fun. It was the last game of the weekend. So all eyes were on it. It wrapped up that, that opening weekend of the tournament and I just thought it was played at a really high level. And Jim and I, rem I remember just taking off the headset, looking at one another, saying, man, that was a serious battle and a lot of fun. The other one, I did the Final Four on the World Feed in 2010. And it's Butler Duke in Indianapolis. I I'm huge in Indonesia, Matt. I, I don't want to get into the particular. You say, hey, hey, you said you wouldn't bring this up on the show, by the way. I know, I know, but I couldn't help it. Like when I have a chance to plug my all popularity right. in Indonesia, I got to do it. But let's not go into Finland because we all know the story. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. That ending to be on the microphone for that, I was doing the games with Pete Gillen and the indelible image of Hayward and the hoist and what was at stake, the sliding doors theory, mm -hmm. the butterfly effect of that, it changes lives, it changes legacies. And it may have gone down as the greatest ending in sports history if that ball goes in, based on where the game was, who was shooting it, who was on the other end of it. There's so many tentacles to it. So I think that game, probably is going to rank up there just based on how many effects we saw on the result. Uh, for people that get curious on this, and I am one of them, I, uh, I remember talking with, with Nance about this very thing as well. Comes to game prep, uh, take us into your world here before you fly out to Arizona. How are you prepping for these final? Well, how are you preparing to do the job? And I assume it's the exact same here, albeit fewer sure. games than what you would have done this past weekend in Dallas. And obviously the the very heavy load. People don't I, I think people most people don't realize for the broadcasting side, calling the first two days of the tournament and getting four yep. games. I mean, that is uh, truly uh, one of the feats of strength, no doubt about in the business. But what what is your prep and how if it, if it has changed at all from, you know, you setting up at Barclays that uh, that Friday versus what you're going to do here? Yep. Take us inside your world real quick. This is going to sound counterintuitive, but I will probably do less because I've had all four teams. I have a working knowledge of all four teams. I will obviously comb through a bunch of notes throughout the week and I will jot them down and I will put them on my boards. I just happen to have my boards here. So a Purdue board looks a little something like wow. this. That's the good stuff. If you are listening to the pod, please go to the YouTube channel. He's giving you a little bit of look at the board there. So that's all the background, all the biographical information, some scouting report material that I've compiled over the course of the season. And the same holds true for North Carolina. Same deal. Yeah. You just multiply it. And I have the UConn board and the Alabama board. Same situation here. Not a lot changes there. Updating numbers, of course, stats, and making sure you've got all your uh, facts and figures right. And then it is about trying to find a, a few more nuggets of information. But it's that very fine line also, Matt, of you've got 
fans that have followed these teams throughout the year. They know everything about their program. And then fans that are just tuning in for the first time. And you've got to be able to walk that line and recognize that you don't want to offend either side. You can't assume that everybody in the audience knows NC State's story, but you can't also go to the rudimentary part of it and start telling things that are for just the layman. So you've got to be able to, to balance it. And, and I really do view it that way. And it's important to, to have a plan, um, but I might end up doing a bit less and taking a step back and letting some of the sounds and the pictures do more of their job. Uh, but you get caught up in the game in the moment as well. If the games are competitive, you know that uh, we're going to be right there with it, riding the roller coaster like everybody else. We're coming off, by the way, this was released earlier on Tuesday. Uh, CBS Sports and uh, the the release here. CBS Sports and TNT Sports deliver the most watched Elite Eight day since 2019. Wow. The game that, uh, that I and Grant Tracy and, and Raf were on uh, was, yep. uh, yeah, most watched 15.1 million viewers, up 34%. Uh, the most watched telecast on Easter on any network in 11 years. Mm. And for um, to put that in perspective, there were only five college football games total this past season. I'm including the CFP that had yep. more viewers than NC State versus Duke on Sunday. And you you know just an incredible crew obviously but uh but everyone rose to the moment and yet again you know i'm 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 at my house watching the game and i just know people listening and watching feel the same way just it to have you you deserve this spot you it, i hear you call that game was just incredible you, you hit all of the right notes and i assume you you but Correct me if I'm wrong, and I know you're dying to. Um, I, 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 I assume that when you are in the the moment and calling these games, while being aware that you're on your broadcast sure. television to millions and millions of people, how do you get yourself into maybe a tunnel or a state of mind where you, you kind of block out everything that needs to be blocked out? Maybe it's just intuitive, but I've always been intrigued uh, by announcers that that do that and and how their process comes to be. I think the the muscle memory of doing as many games that I do a year helps me, works to my advantage. I'm doing about 100 basketball games a year between NBA and college, and I don't take that lightly. If you treat all of them as important, then you're not going to places that you're not used to going. So a Nets-Indiana Pacers game is still very important to me. There's still an audience that cares. Uh, there are people watching that either have skin in the game or their son is playing or their nephew or their cousin, or as we know, Matt, we're in a new world where they actually have a wager on the game and they're paying attention in that light. But because I've always tried to treat all of these games as important and that they mean something, now getting to this stage, it doesn't feel like I've got to change how I do it or shift to another gear. And as far as the compartmentalization, I remind myself consistently, what would I need if I was sitting on my couch? What would I be curious about? What's the information that I would require? What would I find interesting? And I'm constantly reminding myself of that, not just on calls, but on the flow of information, You know, not just throwing something out there because it's on my chart, but does it really pertain to what we're watching? Does it connect to what people are, are watching? So if you look at it in that light, it's breaking it down to the simplest form. And, and that's how I attempt to do it. Uh, would I like this? If I was watching, would I like this? Mm -hmm. And that that's pretty much the philosophy that I go with. I hear you the, all the way on that. The, uh, the final four, men's final four will air this Saturday. Um, by the way, I'm doing this promo here. You're not, you're not getting out in 60 seconds. So I got, I got a couple more, but just as a reminder to our <laughs> audience, 609 PM Eastern 309 out where we'll be TBS, TNT, true TV, uh, emanating from Glendale. It'll be 11 seed NC state versus one seed Purdue first. I an Eagle, Bill Raftery, Grant Hill, Tracy Wolfson, the great Tracy Wolfson. That's at 609. And then approximately 849 PM Eastern TBS, TNT, true TV, um, it will be four seed Alabama versus one seed UConn. One more question on this final four, and then I got something uh, fun off the board for you. Um, 
storyline. I, I love this. I love every final four. I it just every single final four, final four. They, they all appeal to me for, for a variety of reasons, but this one has the behemoth that is UConn trying to go back to back. It's historic. They are on a tear, you know, Agreed. they are Voltron. Uh, you've got Alabama, which has never been to a final four. And yeah. it's in the unusual spot of its fan base being on the wrong end of a big point spread in a national semifinal, a different sport. Uh, but here they are. And, uh, and we'll see if, and they've got this, uh, amazing offense, right? They can, they've dropped a hundred plus points a dozen times this year. You've got DJ Burns who has taken over this tournament and become the face of it among players. I, I, it's it's him and him or Edie, and DJ Burns has just burst onto the scene. It's a national sensation. Then, obviously, the Purdue redemptive arc after last season and what what happened there. For you, f- purely from a storyline standpoint, as someone who has been with all these teams called the tournament, you've called all these schools over the years, uh, which one to you seems to have the heaviest uh, a- appeal to the uh, to the every person fan going to this. Is it UConn being the beast? Is it Purdue with the player mm-hmm. of the year, two-time player of the year? Is it NC State, a, a school with, with two national titles, just a bolt from the blue having this unprecedented run? Which one do you think actually, because I got to talk about on HQ later today. I'm going to steal your answer, by the way. So <laughs> now I need your answer so I can use it on uh, on TV a bit later. But I'm curious which one you think uh, has the most weight or, uh, or noise attached to it. Matt, you've nailed all of it. And this final four checks every box for the reasons that you just laid out. Every category is covered. You do have the juggernaut. That is UConn. You do have Alabama that was supposed to do this a year ago. They were the number one overall seed. So a year later, they're now experiencing something for the first time in program history. Purdue, there was almost this collective release last week. You saw it from Zach Eady in the interview with our colleague, the great Evan Washburn, Mm -hmm. literally (laughs) saying things that you did not expect from him to say he's bottled so much in, in my opinion, and kept it inside and it got uncorked in the win over Tennessee. Things that he wanted to say, things that he wanted to feel, things that he needed to articulate, he did it. So there is that sense that there's been a release for Purdue. And then we get to the answer to your question. To me, it's NC State. The the natural curiosity of the don't call us Cinderella. Mm-hmm. We're not a Cinderella. We're NC State. We've won championships. We're out of the ACC. We have a, a rich history in basketball. We have indelible images that connect with this event. Jim Valvano running around trying to hug somebody after winning a title. That's in every montage in NCAA tournament history. So NC State is very much a known entity but they have Cinderella qualities. They have no right being here from the outside looking in. But when you meet with Kevin Keats, when you talk to DJ Burns, when you talk to DJ Horn, when you talk to Michael O'Connell, they're not that shocked. They actually believed that they were good enough to be this team. It's just that nobody else believed it and nobody else saw it. And they never proved it during the regular season. This run has been magical they're not showing up in Phoenix because they're just happy to be there. They think they can win the whole thing. And there's a reason why Burns has become so popular. It's infectious. His smile, his joy, all of that is very real. And that would be my headline amongst many headlines. UConn has a chance to go back to back. Matt, I know you've already detailed it, but just for the people listening, watching, The last team that won a title that actually got to a Final Four was Florida, and they won the title. That's the last team. That has not happened. There's not been a team that's been on the precipice or been in the conversation of back-to-back. No team has gotten back to the Final Four after winning it since the Gators went back-to-back. So uh, that shows you what kind of squad UConn is. Yeah, no, it's they're in, they're absurdly dominant. I've been with them the whole way because based here in Connecticut, and it was in Brooklyn, obviously, and then up in Boston. And uh, they're dominant. I mean, they, in my opinion, they are knocking on the door of if they win the title. I mean, we're talking like one of the best teams in the history of the sport. If it continues, another if they get a couple more double digit wins, uh, the case will be overwhelming. Before we get out of here, uh, I did happen to be in Boston. And you had the the blessed assignment of covering everything in Dallas and getting Duke and all that. But I just can't help but wonder, as a man who has never been shy about invoking the occasional Seinfeld reference on a broadcast, and you're talking to, you're talking to someone who in the '90s absolutely had the VCR set, recording the shows, going back and watching. Okay, 
I don't want to overstep my bounds. I I, I no. wonder if I can go toe to toe with you on this, but I can't help but wonder if a small part of you, when you realized on Saturday night in Boston, that one row, one row back, Larry, oh, Larry David was sitting oh, there. He was at it. the game. He's at the game. He's he's heckling Hurley, and saw that. it was. I, I literally saw this man gesticulate like Hurley does, and it wasn't on <laughs> camera. It will be forever burned in my memory. I was laughing on press row because it was incredible, and then he's heckling Hurley to take out the starters with about six minutes to go. Okay, I say that all to say, how badly do you wish you were there to call that game so you could evoke some sort of Seinfeld or Curb reference into the broadcast? Oh, come on! I mean, this is life imitating art, and uh, there would have probably been some form of yada 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 or. You're pretty, pretty, pretty good. Something would have connected us. Costanza, yeah. something, yeah. something would have gotten me there. Uh, I, I think he's a genius. Obviously, that goes without saying. the The Seinfeld show, in and of itself, would have put him in that pantheon. Yes. But I'm a curb guy as well, even though I'm right now three episodes behind because of the NCAA oh. tournament. We're both. I think I'm three behind. I'm going to try and steal at least one, maybe two tonight with my wife. I'm not going to catch up all the way, but I've dodged. I've dodged every spoiler except one. There was a cameo in the most recent episode. I don't know. If I you... saw the same tweet. You probably okay. saw. Yes. So if else is behind, I guess, you know what? No, I'm going to run for the rest of the world. Apparently Bruce Springsteen is, is in, in the latest episode of Curry. What? No, no, I saw it. I saw the tweet. Yes. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll have to, uh, We'll have to uh, riff offline about our, our mutual love of Seinfeld because that's also a very rare thing. Not a lot of people really know about that show, ever reference it. So a very, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Very esoteric. Yeah, very. And that's, and you know, when I think Iron Eagle, I think esoteric for sure. Hey, you're the best. <laughs> you're, you're the best for uh, for hopping on here for 45 minutes. I lied to you. I said it would be 30. Um, you demanded to not go to 31 or I'd be hearing from your lawyers. Uh, I hope they allow me to even fly into Arizona's airspace uh, tomorrow when I when I head out. But no, I appreciate you so much. for No me. problem. Matt, this will be edited, of course, for broadcast. Um, We were live. I, I assumed you were. <laughs> I assumed you were comfortable with going. I assumed you what? were being in front of a microphone talking live. And I, yeah. Okay. We're good. Okay. We're good. I and knew we were live. I, uh, I, we were know, I know. There we go. I only wish, yeah, you know, I wear the band shirts every, every, every time. I, I wish I knew. ABBA or Shaka Khan? Where is it? No, I had my AHA t shirt ready to go. <sighs> Brutal. Drop the ball. Brutal. Brutal. Hey, I didn't listen. Get the memo. Everyone will be tuned in for this final four and championship game. I appreciate you. I look forward to seeing you. You have been watching and listening to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. The next episode is coming with me and Gary Parrish on CBS Sports Network on Thursday on site in Arizona. So you can watch that on CBS Sports Network. I believe it's 2 Eastern. And then that episode will go into the feed. The next two shows, Thursday and Friday, me and GP there provided Ion doesn't try and crash the set. But I never, never say never, right? And, uh, and you'll get to the show then. Ion, thank you so much. We'll talk yep. to you again real soon. Yeah, Ion. 